in the mess here. Brother Andy, uh... Last week, you may remember Flash and Dale and Khan, captain of the Hawkmen, flew in a rocket ship to the yawning market. It's falling on the ground, man. Oh, the humanity and all the best is speeding Well, up. I've never seen anything like it. The color is sort of yellowish-white. It's curious... Spectators now are pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep... The Germans have put Denmark under martial law today, but resistance continues and Danish naval forces have scuttled most of their fleet. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Thank you, everyone. For our swing fans, Columbia offers you Benny Goodman and his orchestra. Coming to you from the Manhattan... Oh, Road. remember, baby, this month is bottoms up fun. Mostly clear, low 33 degrees. The winds will be diminishing throughout the night. A few occasions within our lifetime, a spark happens. A spark of creation. That spark fuels creativity, innovation, genius, and compassion. This spark is Steve Church. And to the people who knew him, worked with him, and loved him, his spark will live forever. I first met Steve Church, I can tell you precisely, it was March 1985. The first time I met Steve Church was when he became the chief engineer of WMMS Radio in Cleveland where I was working at the time. I get a phone call and uh, my wife says, it's this guy, Steve Church, you know. So, uh, then, uh, so then I talked to him and he invited me down for an interview. The first time I met Steve, I was still working for Dolby Laboratories, and um, I guess I was new enough that they decided to send me out to Cleveland. I was working at the Fraunhofer Institute uh, in Nuremberg, where they had developed the MP3 coding algorithm. And um, Steve had come there. I mean, he came to, to Nuremberg and visited and licensed this MP3 uh, coding algorithm. At the time, I was a chief engineer in Washington, D.C. for a, a station that had just converted to a talk format. AM talk format, and uh, I wasn't happy with the sound of the callers on my radio station. I knew in 30 seconds that Steve Church, after meeting him, he wasn't going to need any help to get acclimated. I knew this guy was a player. You know, I think like a lot of folks, uh, I was a little scared of Steve. I was scared of saying something stupid. <laughs> and, you know, S Steve just always seemed so bright and no knew something about everything, and probably more than, than you did, you know. Steve always either wanted to do things that were never done before or make radical improvements on current technology. For example, he did a little talk show in the days when we did WMMS. He was chief engineer, but he did a little Sunday night talk show just for fun. And he was always annoyed by the sound quality of phones on the air from the technology that existed in those days, which was pretty primitive. And so Steve cooked up what essentially was the Telos 10, the uh, improved method of putting phone calls on the air with higher quality and independent gain between the host and the caller. I said to him, I said, are you the Steve Church? Somebody told me that you developed a digital-based telephone hybrid. And he said, in typical Steve fashion, I am. And I said, I want to buy one. He said, oh. Excuse me, Frank, but uh, we just barely met, but you haven't heard it. I said, well, but I understand the concept because I, I told him my analog idea and I knew where the faults in it would be. And, you know, when you're the chief engineer at that time, like I was, of uh, the number one radio station in New York City, price wasn't, you know, a thing. And Steve said, well, Frank, there's an Among Friends price. Uh, I can sell you one for $2,000. I said, sold. The way the telephone system worked, there was this switching noise that would the jock would hear, and it, it was like this bunk or like this kachunk. Well, the Telos 10 would mute the audio between the calls, so the kachunk was gone. About 20 minutes into the show, the phone rings. I answer the phone, and it's Scott saying to me, "Franco, you're killing me." Scott, what's the matter? Is the phone working? The phone sounds great, but you, I lost my kachunk, kachunk, kachunk. Goodbye. That's when I knew this thing was kicked butt. Steve realized very quickly that if he was going to be successful in business, he would need to make sure he could stay in business. And he and I had a talk about this over a beer one time. I said, Steve, so what's the most important thing you ever learned about being in business? And he goes, Marty, there's one thing my accountant told me many years ago. Never, never run out of cash. 
The beauty of Steve's legacy is that we created a culture here that's now larger than Steve or myself or Tim. And um, the gang get it. More, than, more often than not, Steve would answer the phone. And you know, it's, it's uh, four o'clock in the morning, you know, his time. And he'd be involved in something and the conversation would start. And around about 4 a.m. my time, I'd have to kind of knock it off. But he, you know, he didn't even realize that the time was, that it was so late. And uh, I was running out of gas, but it was always fascinating. Steve would stop by to check in to see how the work was going. And soon we would be so engrossed in a discussion about the product or a particular feature or some problem that hours would go by unnoticed. I think this is what psychologists call a state of flow where you're operating at peak efficiency and lose track of time. You know, Steve was ill and if there, even if there was a day where he was in a lot of discomfort and was having a hard time focusing on the day, you know, if I were come by the visit and start talking about what I'm working on right now, uh, he would light right up, you know, and it just it just lock in and, 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 and you know, so tell me about that. Hmm? So, so, so have you considered, you know, again, have you considered this or, ah, have you ever heard of that? I mean, you know, it is like, it's like, it's like the, the sickness was, didn't exist for that moment. He was just, you know, I think, I think watching someone grow, challenge, and also challenge him, you know, with, by sharing your thoughts and ideas and getting him to think a different way. Steve always said, um, it's got to, the, the product has to be really easy to use. Um, but do magical things, see? So that was always the key, you know. Add the, you had to have that little bit of magic on there, but don't make it too complicated. Because he was proud of the, the employees and proud of the product he was putting out there and wanted us to really sell it because it was great. And, and people really enjoyed talking to us and talking to Steve and talking about the products and what we were putting out. We thought Steve was the eternal bachelor. We really did. To see the softer side of him and what Lana was able to bring out. He was a very nice looking man, yes, but uh, I could feel something inside more deep than usually people do have, you know, like uh, you will believe to first time you will be looking to someone and you will feel something deeply so that's what could happen with us he was amazing really he loved to travel he loved uh, not only travel he loved to learn about different uh, people what they are eating about culture about architecture yes and about many different Things. What I know about Steve, nobody else could know. He would like to help orphan children in Latvia. And uh, I went there for the Christmas time. I bought some presents for them. And uh, we were playing, we were holding each other. And I think uh, Steve um, can see now. I think he can be happy. Have you ever seen a rainbow? Have you ever seen a light bulb blow? Do you want to see your heart get broken? I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Don't say goodbye when you don't have to go. I'd rather need to know see you later would suit me fine you can use that one anytime tell me anything that you like but don't say goodbye I'm very thankful to Steve to be able to have been here to make a living to you know raise my family um, and you know, put shoes in their feet, as I always joke about, and to help me to be uh, a better person. Steve has had that kind of an effect on me. You know, it's, it sounds very trite, you know, what would Steve say? 
um, I do find myself thinking that. I mean, that's become part of me. What I learned from him, uh, I check my own gut reaction, and then I'd say, okay, well, how would, you know? So Steve trained us in a way. You know, what would Steve, what would Steve say? I miss the ability that he had to cut through the noise on something. What I respected the most was his absolute honesty. That's, that's easy, you know. His word was his bond, period. Uh, and, you know, Frank carries that on. I do my best to carry that on as well. It's a, it's a great core value because if, if the people in your life, whether you're working with them, living with them, related to them, if they can't count on what you say, that's really hard to unbury from. And to be completely honest, I'm just not smart enough to keep up with the, the lies. I could obviously speak endlessly about him. Um, and his spirit lives on, we feel it. And um, to do the things that we were able to do together um, is, is one of those treasured memories.